about treasure and the wildness of treasure and the sort of theme of the conference has been those hidden themes. But actually, with this conference, they might not be as hidden as we might have thought because I'm just replicating what a lot of people have said. But I'm going to start with treasure and the legal definition of treasure is very dry. There's no um, flights of fancy, there's no developed object biographies, and it has to be a very legal, clear, sort of black and white definition. But um, because it is so dry, I'll skip this slide. And this is as interesting as I could make the Treasure Act using this slide, to be honest. All treasure is technically the property of the Crown, and then you have the DCMS Code of Practice on how to deal with it. But treasure itself, the wowness of treasure. There are some treasure cases that have just got the wowness innately. The Staffordshire hoard. The Staffordshire hoard um, was found by a meta detector user in Staffordshire, and it has spawned um, its own galleries in the Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery, uh, Potteries Museum and Art Gallery, with exhibitions. It's told stories of the Kingdom of Mercia. It's changed what we've thought. Um, lots of other things have um, come off the back of it. Really, Pieta should be doing this little bit. But um, we've seen the reproduction of the helmets or the conservation that's happening, uh, the religion and the discussions around there. And that is all brilliant. You can see the gallery and just how sumptuous it looks. But there are also hidden characters in this tale of the Staffordshire Horde that doesn't get told so often. So the unsung hero for me for this hoard is the Fines Liaison Officer who dealt with it, Duncan Slark. He's not a Fines Liaison Officer anymore. In fact, he left shortly after the treasure case is all done and dusted. So no, Duncan received a, fine, a phone call from the finder. Um, and Duncan said, well, the finder's really breathless um, and just kept saying gold, I found gold. And Duncan was like, oh, OK, well, do you want to bring it into the museum? We'll make an appointment. He goes, no, 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 you have to come to me. This is just too much. It's all over my dining room table. And Duncan's like, well, we don't really visit people at home. But there was something in the tone. He was like, OK, well, I'll talk to my line manager, who is me. So he agreed that he would go, Duncan would go to the finder's house. But when he arrived, he phoned me to say he'd arrived. I had his address. And then when he left, he'd phone me to go away. So he phoned me at six o'clock, I've arrived, Angie, you know, I'm feeling comfortable. You have to bear in mind that I live just south of Cheltenham, so I wasn't, you know, quite on hand. After two hours, I hadn't heard back from Duncan, so I'm now pacing up and down. We never said a time where I called the police. So um, it's like two hours, I think it's now time to call for help myself on of the M5, but Duncan phoned. Duncan is a really talkative chap. He's never a loss for words. All I had on the phone was a very breathless Duncan. Ange, gold, gold. <laughs> <laughs> and at the time, Duncan drove a quite a battered Nissan Micra. He said, I've got it all in the boot of my car. It needs to go to the museum now. He says, I think my car's doing a wheelie <laughs> with the weight of it. And really, and it was Duncan's amazing liaison skills that he kept everyone on board and took it through the treasure process. But Duncan is one of the voices you don't often hear in relation to the Staffordshire Horde. And I was trying to think what makes the wowness of some treasure cases, because a lot of treasure cases, the bits of thimbles that we see, I mean, I can picture most people holding a bit of metal, who held them, I can make a story. Sometimes it takes a bit more um, effort than other ones, but it's trying to put themes onto these objects. And so one theme is romance, which I quite like. So the object bi biographies and romance, so in the medieval period, romance was demonstrated in giving gifts. It would be the gentleman giving the gift to the woman. They would tend to be, for example, um, medieval brooches similar to the one that Gail showed yesterday, and she had the two interpretations. You now have another interpretation in my very romantic gift, but they're also demonstrating people's wealth as well in giving these gifts. 
And so this is just an example of um, a brooch from the mid 13th to 14th um, century. The inscription is meant to mean, my faith fidelity is to you alone. And it is a beautiful object. And we see these inscriptions on many rings. Again, these are medieval rings, but the inscriptions tend to found on the later rings that, to be honest, don't make a very good photo. They're just like a wedding band. The inscription's on the inside, and you can never get nice photos of them. And as finds liaison officer, when metal detectors find these posy rings, they're sort of the 17th century into the early 18th century. Part of you is quite pleased because you can whip off that report really quickly and bish bash bosh, you're done. But then I pause, it's like, oh, I'm not connecting with that person and that inscription. And then the penny dropped for me is that I have an inscription on the inside of my wedding ring and it says, you are my sunshine. Try and say that without singing it, okay? <laughs> and I haven't confessed that to anyone before, a room full of strangers. Um, and it was then, though, that I made that connection, all those posy rings. I'm not just immediately thinking, bish, bash, bosh, that's a quick report. I'm like, oh, that's so sweet. Look at that. I love you forever, whatever the inscription is. And so those inscriptions for me put the wowness back into the most mundane posy rings. But for other people, people can't picture who was wearing these rings? I mean, this person is a reenactor from the 16th century, but we find these strap mounts, silver strap mounts that they're wearing. And when you're talking to uh, children or even the finders themselves, they can't picture who was wearing them. So perhaps to put the wowness in a very boring mount, we can start to use images of reenactors again. You ask a finder to describe the dress that they think the person was wearing who found one of these mounts, wearing these mounts. And you get everything from something like a linen sack through to almost something like a Victorian fitted corset. They, it never quite gets it right. And to be honest, if I did the same, it would never quite be right. But when people show these images, they make that connection. It's the wowness has come to them, even for a boring mount. I shouldn't say a boring mount. And another thing I was trying to think with treasure and the wowness of treasure, and I think finds liaison officers of the privileged people to have the wowness of the sounds of treasure. So you have to believe this is a medieval coin hoard, but do you know when a medieval coin hoard is being tipped onto the table as the finder's shown it to you, it sounds like a clunky wind chime. It just... By the time it's, the hoard is spat through the treasure process and it's in its individual coin envelope, there's no sound to it. But when the finder brings it out their pockets, look what I found, Ange, and it clatters onto the table. It's an amazing sound, but only finds liaison officers get to hear it. Other sounds with um, treasure. This is a workshop with poet, um, a poet from Shropshire. And again, I'm sort of echoing uh, Gail here. Um, this is Peter, led by Peter Reevil, the poet, whose name I cannot for the life of me remember. And that feels incredibly rude. But they've then, based on treasure items, have produced um, poems and then read them in the poetry readings in the local pub. And going back to Gail's um, image of the plumber, we speak about treasure finds, but we don't, know what happens when finds are first found. And I'm lucky enough to be get sent these images, or I'm, I'm friends with people on Facebook. So the medieval fingering, what museum has got an um, image of medieval fingering being posed on a bit of cornstalk as they're showing it off? Who do you see holding with their um, gloves on that they go ex uh, digging with? the um, fingering that hopefully Worcestershire County Museums are acquiring. Who sees all these faces? With Gail's plumber, we have the face in that newspaper article finding his hoard. We don't have his name. When you go through the Treasure Act, the reports will have the finders' names, but you don't have these gleeful uh, faces who are finding them. You don't have the chap in the middle there who's fallen back with excitement because he's found his first hammered coin. 
We do occasionally have the faces. And so the gentleman, Terry, on the top right there is the gentleman that found the Staffordshire coin hoard. And he's on a talking head um, in the Staffordshire hoard gallery. You've got um, talking, not, almost talking heads next door, but you don't have the sound. The other thing that finds liaison officers here in particular are that regional accents. We don't have the regional accents in relation to treasure in our galleries, but truly the Redditch accent is so different to the Kidderminster accent, which is so different to the Black Country accent. And it's all musical when people are telling you about how they found things and getting excited. Their accents get a bit stronger. Their accents are very different to the Warwickshire accent. We're, we're missing that extra level, that extra depth in our galleries. We're not hearing that excitement. Admittedly, when I was um, here yesterday with the children going around the galleries, you wouldn't have heard it with above the hubble of their noise. But it's another idea to have that we could um, use. And just finally, we did um, an exhibition in Worcester, Treasure 20. It was celebrating 20 years of the Portable Antiquities Scheme. And so we had two cases all full of the treasure items that we'd um, found and the museums had acquired. And I would often meet finders in this gallery just around the corner. I'd be able to watch visitors. There's a third case with this what the finders call the tap boxes. And I've done nothing to these tap boxes. It's like just turned over the couple of bags in there because it revealed the fine spot. All the visitors would stand by that case, talk about the petrol cap that's in there, the toys. They barely glanced at the treasure cases, which, you know, I thought they'd be like, oh, look at that gold Roman fingering. Oh, look what it says about it. They all just stared at the tap boxes. It was that that created the conversation. It was that that created the noise in the gallery. I hope I've got across to you some of the wowness of treasure as a finds liaison officer and perhaps a level that you've not thought of. But thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>